Hello and welcome. I'm Charmaine Whitlow with Macaulay Honors College. On behalf of Macaulay and our Dean, Mary Pearl, we wish we like to thank you for joining us tonight. I think tonight is gonna to be a very special night. Um, February is Black History Month. And although we should be celebrating Black history every day, tonight is a special one because we're gonna look at the community of Little Caribbean. So tonight we have Shelly Worrell of Caribbean and our alum, Anna Luisa Theodoro, who will be moderating with her and a special guest, musical guest, Kareem Thompson of Kareem Thompson Musical. So thank you for joining us. And now I would like to introduce Ms. Shelly Worrell and Anna Luisa Theodoro. Hello, everyone. I'm going to give the floor to Shelly to introduce herself first as one of the spotlights of this event. So Shelly, the floor is yours, and then I'll chime in. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much to Charmaine and Macaulay and CUNY for inviting us. Um, this is such a tremendous honor. Um, for those of you who know me, uh, I actually went to Brooklyn College, and I still live in Flatbush. I'm really proud to be a native. Um, so this, you know, is one of a very, very special event for me. Um, so again, my name is Shelley Worrell. I'm the founder of Caribbean, which is a thriving cultural venture. And we work at the intersection of Caribbean culture, community, and commerce. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of is the development of Little Caribbean that was designated here in Flatbush in 2017. And so I'll pass the mic back to Anna. Thank you, Shelley. Um, hello, everybody. I see we have some people jumping on in the call. Um, my name is Anna Luisa Teodoro. I am a Macaulay alumnus, um, class of 2018. I'm also a graduate from NYU, and it is not only my joy, but my absolute pleasure to get to speak to you all today. And as we go through this talk and events, I really, really want to stress, this is your time as well. Questions in the chat. As much as I know, I'm going to definitely talk Shelly's ear off with a billion and one questions that we have and information that we want to share to you all. Ask us questions. We're going to have a Q&A open at the end. I want to see questions and answers and thoughts. Even a, a reaction emoji is one of my favorites throughout this entire time. So definitely chime in and I'm going to give the floor also to Charmaine to talk a little bit about the event um, as a going before we kind of dive in and get into the meat of this. Thank you, Ana Luisa. So tonight, um, just to let you know in terms of how Macaulay works. So our students in their first year um, and second year, they take Macaulay seminar courses. And one of those seminar courses are the people of New York. So they get to get a chance to research and investigate immigration and migration in New York City and looking at their past, their present and their future. So I believe this program will actually put a lens onto the community of Little Caribbean and just shedding a light of all of the things that the people in this particular community are doing. So we have a lot of people who have came, they migrated here because they wanted a better life. They're coming from different Caribbean countries, um, islands, and just to let you know what February is a big time um, in the islands because carnival is a big part of the culture. And this year and, as, and last year, there were no carnival going on. And for a lot of the islands, this is a big industry in terms of it boosts the economy and it's jobs for the people there. So just looking at this community and what actually they bring to the fabric of America. So I would, again, like to thank you both for being here. Thank you, Charmaine. And to kind of kick this all off, um, and Shelly, to give you a little bit more hype and robust um, of the work that you've been doing and a little bit more background and all of that, I would love all the attendees to first know that you, again, are a Brooklyn alumnus, but also some of the key ways that you're engaging with the Caribbean community. Um, in your words, if when you ever you're pitching Caribbean to everybody, can you kind of explain to us what Caribbean is, what it stands for, and also your trajectory? How did this start up? Yeah, um, I'm gonna start with how it started because it actually started while I was at Brooklyn College a student. So my 
my, my degrees are in anthropology and Caribbean studies. So I was a dual major um, with sort of like a minor in archeology. span So while I was at Brooklyn College, there, were, there was a, um, a scholar who was a Caribbean ar archeologist. And that was really, really interesting because we actually went on a field school to Antigua and we um, did an excavation of a plantation. It's called Betty's Hope. Um, so I spent um, sort of like a mid, like a winter session in Antigua um, with the heads of the department of, of the anthro and archaeology um, department, as well as this scholar who was working on her PhD um, in, in Caribbean archaeology. But the reason why I go back to, to the nexus to Brooklyn College is because, you know, at that time, I just you know, that was sort of like, I graduated, I finished um, in 2000. And so, um, you know, at that time there was a, a, a huge deficit, a huge gap in terms of like Caribbean programming. That has since changed, we're in 2021. Um, but back then there was like, I didn't see myself represented in anything, right? Whether it was film, art, culture, even merch, right? Um, and not, and for, not only, Caribbean, but I would say Caribbean American, which is a very unique experience, as well as, you know, even being from Flatbush. And, and we could talk about that a little bit later, um, especially, you know, vis-a-vis -vis some of the merch that we have been developing. Um, so, you know, I had this idea, like Caribbean came to mind. I didn't know what it would be, but I, you know, I was very interested in like media and tourism. And actually my first year of grad school, it was at NYU. Um, studying hospitality, hospitality and tourism management. And I was at the time a special events director for like five years. Um, and after that, I ended up transferring to um, the new school to study media um, and communications, because again, you know, I saw this gap in terms of Caribbean content. So, uh, so a few years later, I was working after I left my job in hospitality, I ended up getting a job I ended up working in the media. I was working in television. So I, was, I worked at um, different TV networks at Time Warner, um, where I launched a number of um, ethnic channels. I was responsible for launching all the video on demand, um, polling on TV, like all of the, like, the, the tech um, related to television and cable. Um, and then after that, I went to, um, you know, mo most recently to, to Google. That was like my last corporate job. Um, but I, I say that because there was a time where I was between two opportunities and one of my classmates, her name is Chantel Bell. Um, she lives on Lenox Road and she was also a Caribbean um, studies major. She's Jamaican. And um, we also went on that field school together. Um, so she was running the Caribbean branch um, or the Caribbean center at the Flatbush Brooklyn Public Library. So they have like a whole floor, a whole space developed um, dedicated to Caribbean culture and heritage, which a lot of people don't know about. But she was at that time programming that space. And she was like, Shelly, you remember you had that idea to do like this film festival to do Caribbean? And I was like, yeah. And um, so we put up our first program, which was the Flatbush Film Festival. Um, it was horrible. I had no idea what I was doing. Like no one showed up except for the people who just kind of frequent the library. And um, I was like, this sucks. I'm going back to my day job. Like, I, this is not, I'm not cut out for this. And then a few months later, um, you know, the earthquake ha happened in Haiti and I was personally impacted because one of my mentors was working there and um, at the UN and she actually um, didn't make it. And um, so our co-founder Jean-Luc, he made a film and um, on the ground on Haiti, it was actually a Caribbean relief effort and I thought it was really important um, to screen that film here in the community in Flatbush. And so at the time we, we just went, I went about it very differently than I did the first. Um, we also, I'm a lover of art, I collect art. Um, you know, I have a lot of Caribbean art here um, from the Caribbean as well as from artists from the, the diaspora. And um, so we added art as well as there was live music. There was a, a rah-rah performance. And then we also started to engage with the local businesses. So there was a local business, it was not Caribbean owned who donated and personally drove um, all of the food to the event. Um, and we had about over 300 people attend. And from there, we just continue to iterate and evolve our programming. Um, so the way I describe Caribbean today 
is a thriving cultural venture that works at the intersection of Caribbean culture, community, and commerce. But when we started, you know, everyone's talking about how it started and how it's going. So that's how it's going. But how it started, it was building community through the lens of Caribbean film, art, and culture. And I see a lot in when you're talking about this and the passion that you have for it, um, a word that keeps coming up, at least when I think about this or in your words, is importance. That this is something that you felt was important, the community was important. Can you speak a little bit more on that of, I'm curious to know, was there any pushback um, from when you were founding this of getting funding or talking to people of stressing that importance to others? Did others see that level of interest and in, of culture, community and commerce that you bring up? Or is it something that was innate to everybody that you were speaking to? Yeah, I don't think it was innate. Um, you know, I think it, when we first started, one of the things that we used to do is we used a lot of flags, right? So if we were screening a, a Haitian movie night or Jamaican movie night or Trinidadian movie night, we would use that country's flags, right? Because we, you know, of course we're here in Brooklyn and you, you think about the parade and it's just like a sea of flags. Like virtually every Caribbean country is represented on, on the parkway. So, you know, I think that very early on, it was hard to get us all sort of aligned as like a Caribbean community like around like one island versus another island being like, oh, well, I'm only going to go to the Jamaican film or I'm only going to go to the Trinidadian film or the Haitian film. Um, so that was like, I think, an initial struggle. Of course, funding, you know, we didn't have any funding um, or any money at all in the beginning, but we just like we still are, are extremely resourceful. We live in the community. Um, I've also traveled very extensively between, and I grew up between New York and the Caribbean. So I started traveling to um, my family's from Trinidad and I started going to Trinidad when I was six months old, um, which is very normal in a Caribbean household. And I went without my parents. Don't judge them. My mom might be on here, but I was going back home to visit my aunts, my uncles, my cousins and my grandparents because they were not here yet. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, I have this dual degree in anthropology and Caribbean studies. I've been to over 30 Caribbean islands. So from Puerto Rico to Cuba to Haiti you know, and there are many, Guadalupe, Martinique, St. Lucia, I mean, Barbados, of course, Trinidad, and many of them I've been to like dozens of times. Um, Antigua, I mentioned with the field school, um, even islands people have not heard about like Mary Gallant and Dominica, like not the Dominican Republic. So, um, so, you know, a lot of the, the work that I do apart from living in a thriving Caribbean community. I also spent a lot Panama as well. Um, so I, I've spent a lot of time traveling, um, presenting at conferences, um, and playing mass, jumping up at different carnivals as well, which are, you know, very, very different experiences from island to island, because just like being Black is not a, a monolith, being Caribbean is not a monolith. Um, so, you know, I had a conversation earlier this week we're, we're convening a talk um, via Little Caribbean. Like even, you know, we're talking about, you know, identity and, and your heritage and your culture. And even though, you know, you look at me and you're like, Shelly is black. I'm actually, I am black for sure. But my mother is Indian. She's East Indian. So I'm mixed in, you know, in, in Trinidad, they will call that dobla, right? I mean, that doesn't exist here in the United States as a construct, um, but, why should, you know, a few years ago, I was speaking to the then Trinidad ambassador, and she it was of East Indian descent, and she said to me, like, and my middle name is Vidya, um, and the reason I bring it up is because it's a Hindu name, and she said, well, you shouldn't deny half of yourself, like, you know, the fact that you are half East Indian, you look like my nieces, you, you know, I can see your, you know, you have a, an East Indian name. My mother's maiden name is, is Samaru. So like, why would you deny half of your, your heritage and your identity? So that's something I've been thinking about a lot too. And a lot of, and thank you for sharing at least a lot of the story of how it comes. I'm envisioning of people or people coming to this event, um, thinking about their own personal histories of how they see themselves reflected or not reflected in New York. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about or share with us of, unfortunately in this online setting, we can't 
personally be all in the same group of seeing what the Caribbean house looks like, but I would love for you to give us a little bit of hint and insight as to the community building that Caribbean does in one, the ideas of the Caribbean people are not one monolithic viewpoint, as you're bringing up different shades of identity of colors and communities and things like that, of what that looks like and how it kind of presents itself in what you're doing. And I think we might have a little bit of a lag with uh, video, so I apologize for everybody on the call, but we're going to tie this in. But what I can do, as Shelly kind of gets back on board, is talk a little bit about um, some things that I'm thinking of. And as people drop in their Q&A questions um, throughout the talk, is peopling of New York with Macaulay. So as we talk about community of uh, community buildings and neighborhoods and ideas of a Caribbean community, especially in Brooklyn, I, I'm also a Brooklyn College alumnus, and the entire community is a strong Caribbean background of how you see yourself reflected in that. And students who have taken a Peopling of New York course and students who um, might be taking it within the future, what does that look like for you? When we think of building New York and we think of building communities, do we see yourself reflected? Maybe these are questions to bring up within your classrooms. Um, uh, when we're doing a freshman seminar, people in New York, is the community represented in the Caribbean community, Asian community, South American community? So. Shelly, as you jumped off, I went into a small spiel <laughs> about peopling of New York, but I would love for you to continue the thoughts that we were talking about of um, Caribbean community building and presence in New York. Sure. Um, I apologize. I have very unstable internet um, right now, and so I apologize um, for that. Um, so, you know, over the last couple, like, I would say four years or so since we have been Focus hyper focused on developing Little Caribbean. I would say like our efforts in terms of community building um, have sort of like been, you know, a, a, a core focus of mine and a core focus of the organization. Um, and I think it's really important. Like one of the things that I've I talk about very very frequently um, is over twenty percent of uh, just about twenty percent of New York is of Caribbean descent, right? And I define the Caribbean as the English speaking Caribbean, the French Creole speaking um, Caribbean, the Spanish speaking Caribbean, as well as the Dutch speaking Caribbean, right? So I'm a Caribbeanist, I have a degree in it. Um, we can pull out a map, look at the region. Um, and so it includes the Caribbean as well as the basin. So the basin countries are the Guyanas, Colombia, Panama, Belize, et cetera. Um, so for me, I thought it was extremely important to, um, thank you for that, Charmaine. <laughs> I, I thought it was extremely important that we have visibility as a Caribbean community here in New York. So in addition to working on the development of Little Caribbean, we were also very involved with the development of Little Dominican Republic in Washington Heights. So we're the ones sort of powering it in the background. Um, one of our most recent initiatives was putting Little Caribbean on the map, on Google Maps. Um, which is huge. I'm also working with my team on making sure all of the businesses that are not on Google Maps. And I think her, I spoke with her earlier, Kenya, who's like our rock star um, and responsible for a lot of this stuff. She is like, she's identified about a hundred businesses that are not even on the map yet, right? And it's almost like, if you're not on the map, do we exist, right? And the other piece I wanted to say about sort of this community building and, and Little Caribbean is, that you know, when I left my job at Google, um, after I had like a, a brief um, consultancy, I was working at, at Madison Square Garden and launching all of their digital platforms and things like that. Um, you know, I started spending a lot more time at home because I wasn't going to Chelsea, I wasn't going to Madison Square Garden or you know wherever I was working in the city, and I did that for a long time, like Monday to Friday, nine to five. Or even after, if you're going out after work for drinks or to socialize or in an event, your trade events are usually in the evening, um, you're not getting back home to Flatbush until like after 8, 9 p.m. And back then, we didn't have the Rogers Garden. We didn't have, um, you know, sip on wine and all of these other like cool places that you can like go on weekends or even after work. Um, so, you know, I started to ask myself as I was walking, I was working on the Caribbean house. Um, it was at the time at Flatbush Kate and Market, 
you know, I live close to King's Theater and I was like, why isn't there a little Caribbean? Like we have three Chinatowns in New York. There are two little Italy's. We have a K-town, we have little Brazil, little Russia, you know, um, li little Bangladesh. Like, why isn't there a little Caribbean? And I started, I started you asking- Let me very briefly, because on that point, because I will forget it. Why do you think that there hasn't been just historically a little Caribbean on a map? Or, and when we think of tourism, like how you say, we have three different Chinatowns. It's one of the biggest stops when people come outside to visit New York, people do see that. And I know in, in previous conversations you have, you envisioned that to Little Caribbean being the spot for people to come see that. Do you have any insights of, as to why? Um, I don't, because no one, well, I mean, first of all, I can tell you that when I started to have meetings, it was everyone's idea. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Like if it were your idea and you thought about it, like, you know, why didn't you do it? Right. Um, so I wouldn't say everyone, but there are quite a few people who were like, it's, it was their idea. Um, but I don't, no one knew. I mean, and no one knew how to do it either. Right. So like I was asking the question over and over to a lot of stakeholders and no one, like it took a while for me to get to the answer of like how you create a little Caribbean. Um, and finally, when I did, you know, the recommendation from the mayor's office of community affairs was that Caribbean, given our depth in Caribbean culture, in Caribbean community, in Caribbean programming, that we develop it in partnership with the BITS, the local um, business improvement districts. Okay. And I believe one of the, I saw um, Kenneth, uh, one of our really good friends and colleagues from the Flatbush Nostrand Junction bid, um, which was the site of our announcement um and will be a part of our next roundup of Caribbean businesses I've been doing some writing lately and um Kenneth has been a very um key partner and integral part of of Little Caribbean that's really really interesting in terms of I'm seeing a lot of connections with the importance of presence um business ownership and the supporting of black businesses especially when we think of in cultural communities when we think of New York in that regard of pulling from our community as opposed to seeking elsewhere because we have all this at home. We, we truly, as you said in your backyard, we have this in Flatbush, we have these restaurants, we have these areas of the, the importance of looking again in our backyards for things like that. And I would love to kind of too, when we think of the historical aspect of this into the present day, as we go back into um, early Caribbean migration and things like that in the formation of New York, I know a lot of students and a lot of attendees on this call um, definitely either beginning their own research, um, have their own business endeavors and things like that. If you could talk a little bit about, I'm thinking in peopling of New York, which kind of the context of this course of um, when we think of New York City, um, I think it's very obvious as to why certain groups are marginalized, if we're going to call a thing a thing, why Black communities are specifically not painted within this dichotomy of what history is. But if you could speak a little bit about not only the importance, but the really, really rich history that Caribbean um, communities have had in New York, and also how Caribbean is highlighting that in whether it be businesses, putting things on a map, merch, and general everyday presence. Yeah, I mean, so there were two waves of migration. So the first, you know, early wave of people, the first West Indians coming to New York was in the 20s. And one of my great aunts was part of that whole migration period. And then you saw a, a, another influx in the 60s, um, I would say, say through the 80s, right? Um, because there was a shift in terms of the um, immigration laws. And of course, there was also a direct um, sort of effort to recruit Caribbean nurses as well as Caribbean teachers, right? So a lot of um, Caribbean people started to migrate in large numbers um, during, I would say, the 60s and the 80s. The, the other thing I always talk about when I'm talking about things like the Caribbean, especially in New York and, or in, any, in anywhere in a historical context, is you have to look at the carnival. Because one of the things that we, one of our biggest exports, um, you know, I happen to be Trinidadian, so, you know, the carnival in New York was started by Trinidadi Trinidadians, the carnival in London was started by Trinidadians. 
but the carnival in New York is over 50 years old, right? So if that carnival is, is plus 50 years old, going on 55, I can't remember exactly how many, it might be like 53, 54 ish. Um, then you know that there's a strong community there, right? So, you know, it gives you sort of like a, a historical context of like how long, because it takes a while just to, to put up a carnival, right? It's not like you just like, oh, I'm having a carnival and, you know, it happens just like that. Just like Little Caribbean is still under development. So, you know, the things that we've been doing, you know, we have ongoing um, links campaign where, you know, we're in Black History Month, but our big month, one of our big tent pole months is June, which is National Caribbean American Heritage Month. So we put up Caribbean American icons all throughout the city. When it started, it was they only wanted to target like black and brown communities like Flatbush and areas of the Bronx, areas of Queens. And I was like, but we're everywhere. Like even if we're not living there, like in Midtown or you know, on the Upper East Side, but we work there. We go shopping there, we're walking the streets. So why can't we be everywhere? And so that's one example. Another example is what you're looking at is this exhibition called Caribbean Spirit on Google Arts and Culture. Um, so we have two ex virtual exhibitions that are, are live. This is one which talks about the impact and influence of Caribbean Americans, as well as um, there's another one called Life with Basquiat, which is a photo essay by one of his ex-girlfriends, Alexis, Alexis Adler. So here you see um, some of those photos. Um, and then, of course, we have other initiatives like, um, you know, putting Little Caribbean on Google Maps, which you saw earlier. We create merch. Um, one of the things very early on why we started creating merch, it wasn't only about Caribbean and saying, I am Caribbean, yo soy Caribbean, je suis Caribbean, moi Caribbean, ik ben Caribbean, which is I am in, in most, in all of the Caribbean languages. But it was also, sometimes I would look at maps, because I, of course I have a thing for maps. Um, but I would look at maps and Flatbush wouldn't be on it. And I'm like, how do I have, why am I looking when Brooklyn became a brand, right? And people, everyone started making Brooklyn merch and, um, you know, maps and t-shirts and towels and all of, like, I would look at merchandise and our whole neighborhood, which is one of the um, first towns in Brooklyn, uh, Flatbush, it was, there were four towns and Flatbush was one of them. And you just left off Flatbush. Like, how, how is that? And so that's how we started making Flatbush merch. Um, and, and because I really love maps and geography, um, I, one of the first things that we did when we developed Little Caribbean is we mapped it out. I was like, we need a map, right? And now that map has since iterated to like more of an artistic, um, it's like in version two, um, you know, an artistic interpretation of the neighborhood. There's some like Flatbush cats on it. There, you know, a few other like landmarks, the parrots that down by Brooklyn College are, is on it. Um, and a few other, you know, important um, things that are significant. But for, for me, I thought that that was like one of the most important things. And of course, tours. So that goes back to, and, you know, and, and the funny thing is like, I'm a person who hates tours. I never travel and go on tours because I like to do my own thing. But, you know, a few years ago, I was asked to give a tour of Flatbush, um, again, by Kenneth. So the, there's an uh, International Jane's Walk um, that happens every May. And I was asked to give a tour of Flatbush. And I was like, this is crazy. I'm not a tour guide, like, whatever. I, I'm not doing this. But over seven, 70 people showed up which is like huge for a tour. Like a tour is usually 10 to 12 people. I was like, who are these people, right? And there were people who came from all over. Um, and so when we, you know, I had two years of that under my belt. I knew what people were asking about the neighborhood, right? And, you know, what they were most interested in. And from that, that is how, when, as soon as we launched Little Caribbean, the first thing we did is we launched a tour, right? I think the, the, that weekend, that Saturday, or if not that Saturday, the following Saturday, we had a tour. And that holiday, we had a um, a dollar van tour. It was it was crazy. It was like epic. We had we had to rent two dollar vans um, because the first one filled up so fast. Um, so I had to bring. Um, at the time, it was my intern. Her name was Kara. We used to call her Kara Being. 
And I had to bring her to be like the chaperone on the second tour to, um, bus because I was like, well, we, you know, we need someone from the team on, on the bus. But it was, it was crazy. I mean, it was so much fun. Um, and people came from Switzerland. People came from Canada. People came from Washington state. They were just visiting. I mean, it was all over. And that's when we got invited by New York City Tourism to be a part of their program, their training program. And thank you for sharing that. I'm just, I'm in, envisioning what these buses look like and of vans of people coming in and wanting to see it and also learning something that they truly would never learn anywhere else, whether it's an anecdotal experience and learning with other people or if somebody was in an anthropology program and just had a special niche interest of the work that you're doing or the work that's being promoted that's already in the community, already in the area, just highlighting what's already there and building upon that. And I think before we open it up for Q&A, um, a lot I feel of what we observe in the news throughout media, especially within these past couple of months, highlights a lot around a lot of trauma that's going along with, our, with all of our respective communities. So I would really love a space for you to also share with us some things that you find joyful about what Carrie Bean is doing. Where, where are you at this point gathering joy from not only the work that you do, because as much as it's joyful work, it is work. <laughs> it is an Excel spreadsheet at the end of the day sometimes that you're looking at, but what are some things from being involved not only um, having your community and your identity being not only a pivotal point for learning, but for growth, what are some areas of joy that you're finding within the work that you do that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, I know I talked about this a lot during this call, but right now, like my most joyful thing is like Little Caribbean being on the map. And, and the reason why it's like, it's not only the map, like if I'm taking a Lyft, if I'm taking an Uber, if I'm ordering food, we have, and we have a relationship right now with Lyft and with DoorDash and Caviar. So we receive credits to support black and, you know, most Afro, you know, Afro-Caribbean and some are Indo-Caribbean as well, businesses um, here in Flatbush. And so we reserve a few of those for our team, right? Because we have meetings, we have big places to go. Um, so I would say one would be, you know, whenever I'm in a um, Lyft, Uber, ordering food, seeing Little Caribbean on the map is like, like I screen grab it every time. And plus a lot of my friends have, and people who live in the community, business owners, et cetera, et cetera they have like sent me messages or they're like, oh my God. Um, so I, I really am loving that right now. And, but it's also still re really, really new. Um, I also love that like, you know, I've, a lot of the businesses have been getting a lot of like national attention. So like on Buzzfeed on, you know, I was on FUBU, um, FUBU's Instagram earlier. I saw they, they promoted two local businesses, both the Rogers Garden, as well as, um, aunts and uncles. And I think that that's amazing, um, that they're getting the shine and hopefully they'll, um, get to thrive and continue to um, sustain themselves post pandemic. Those are two businesses that open during the pandemic. Um, I also love like Allen's Bakery. I love La Bay Market. Um, I was recently named New Yorker of the Week last week. Um, so I was really proud of that. Um, it felt like a kind of big deal. Um, it was also my birthday last week. So it was like a good sort of like moment. Um, loving my mom's black cake. My mom made me black cake for my birthday. Um, so that's also really amazing. Um, and I just love walking around, like just seeing everyone here and just going island hopping in, in the neighborhood. I think it's great because you, you can't go, people, you can't go island hopping in the Caribbean. I don't know if you've ever traveled from island to island, but it is horrible to travel on what we call leave island anytime, Liat, because you're literally like stopping on every island and waiting and it's like, it gets hot, the plane is small, you can't bring a lot of luggage. So it's very expensive. Um, but here in Flatbush, you can island hop. Right in your backyard. And I think now it's a really great point to kind of transition into some questions. I see some people coming in with some really, really great questions. I also encourage all the attendees, if you have something as we're talking that you wanna highlight on, things like that, drop it in the chat, drop it in the Q and A. And one of the most light questions right now is um, we have one Kendi asking is how do you persevere through the difficulties of building this from the ground up? Um, that's a great, how do I persevere? I mean, 
you know, I think it's just through, you know, I live here, <laughs> right? So um, in terms of like Little Caribbean, like I live on the ground and I want that this neighborhood to continue to be a Caribbean community. I mean, we are in gentrification. When I walk yesterday, I was like, when I see these buildings like being ripped down and then in two weeks you see a cardboard building being put up, it breaks my heart. Like on the, the, the bank on Flatbush next to um, King's Theater, like I've been tagging New York City landmarks you know, I try to share it with the community so they can also chime in, but it's painful because I'm wondering, I ask myself like in 20 years, what will this neighborhood look like? And do I still want to live here? I do want to still live here. I don't want to have to leave because, um, you know, the neighborhood has changed so, so much, right? And there's no more Allen's Bakery. There's no more Le Bay Market. There's no more aunts and uncles or whatever is to come, right? I want this neighborhood to remain what it is. Uh, that's why I chose to live here. And we have another one jumping in as well, is what do you envision for Caribbean in the future? That kind of ties into what you're saying of, I want to be here in the future, but what are some other um, plans that you have for, for the future? Um, you know, I, I would love Caribbean to, to continue to thrive. Um, we're always iterating and evolving our model. Um, we are a very flexible organization. Um, because we're small and I think we're, we're pretty innovative in terms of, of our work, you know, so even last year we really doubled down on our efforts to support our community during the pandemic. Um, so I just would love Caribbean to sort of like continue to thrive for decades to, to come. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I mean, of course, you know, we want it to be become like bigger and more global and things like that. Um, and then we have another person asking if there's other little Caribbeans in the U.S. as well. So other cities, whether it be metropolitan or small, if there's, if there's anything else like this anywhere, or is New York and Flatbush a special of its own? There is one little Caribbean in the world. It's in Flatbush. We're, and maybe there'll be others later. I don't know. But, I, you know, I thought about this, like, intellectually. I think it'll be very difficult to have another little Caribbean. And here's why, because you need the diverse Caribbean community to be living there. So when you think about other cities like Toronto, right, who, who, that now has little Jamaica, I love, I love them. They have a national patty day and it was yesterday and I thought it was, that was so cool. So um, in Miami, you have a little Haiti and you have a little um, Havana. Um, I actually went on one of their tours, it was pretty cool. Um, I think in London, it would probably be like a little Trinidad or a little Jamaica, but again, there's already another, um, there's an, another designation now in Toronto that has become more official over the last, I would say, I've been seeing that over like the last year or so. Um, but that's, we're uniquely different in New York is that we have the diverse Caribbean community here. It's not only Anglophone, it's not only Francophone, it's not only Spanish speaking or Dutch speaking, it's the diversity. And we happen to be live, I happen to live and I was born in this neighborhood. Um, and um, I was born in Kings County Hospital. My brother was born across the street at Downstate and my parents lived on Bedford Avenue. My mother's first job, she's an accountant. She's on here. My mother is Marva Samaru, you'll see her. Um, and <laughs> she worked right at Sears in the towers because she worked in the administrative part. So when she was pregnant with me, so like, um, I don't know that there could be another little Caribbean somewhere else, but maybe. Maybe perhaps, hopefully, I mean, in terms of this community building and things like that, but I do have to say to rebuild what you've done in any other place to replicate it is gonna be a hard feat for anybody. Just the expansive work that you've been doing and also I know I'm proud to learn about it. I can only imagine how proud you are to be a part of it. Um, and to kind of tie it up, I'm going to end up with two small questions at the end. I do not want to leave out Dean Mary Pearl's aunt question of how many different Caribbean countries can you visit when you do island hop in Flashbush? Um, we, so on our tours, we usually go to Guyana, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Trinidad, Grenada, St. Vincent, so at least seven. Um, there's also a, um, depending on the, the date, the, the tour, 
sometimes we go to mass camps. Some we go to a record shop that play. We have to force them to play Afro Caribbean music because it's a, they're heavily um, focused on at the Africa, um, Africa, the continent. So they play a lot of their um, their music. So like more like vintage African um, vinyl, but um, that's owned by brothers who are from the Virgin Islands. So we can add them to the mix as well. Um, so yeah, so about I would say seven to eight. But you know our tours have a specific itinerary. And it's, you know, and, and um, time frame. they're usually about two and a half to three hours. So some have been longer. Um, so you can actually go to more places. Like if you wanted to just walk around independently, you know, there are Panamanian restaurants. I mean, they're all different types of um, Caribbean countries that are represented here. And I think one last thing that I'm going to ask um, before we tie it off and also to lead into Kareem, I think this is going to be a really great question. What does your group do for Caribbean artists? Yeah, I mean, we celebrate um, Caribbean artists and artisans. So we host exhibitions. Um, we have um, had um, some exhibitions where you could not buy the art. So when we've done exhibitions at um, the Caribbean House, and it was placed at the Brooklyn Museum. Of course, we couldn't sell the art there because you don't buy art in a museum. Um, but when we've had them in elsewhere, we have had um, artists who are selling their art, um, as well as we host an annual Caribbean themed holiday market. Um, so right now the Caribbean house is placed in Prospect Park at the um, skating rink. And we featured over 15 um, artisans. In fact, we just today got a shipment of guava cookies from Puerto Rico. It literally came today and we're like the only one in New York selling them. Um, you know, we have, a, so we have a lot of different product offerings that are very unique and special, um, around food, around jewelry, um, wellness products. Um, there, there are smaller art products as well. Um, and of course you saw as well, you also saw our virtual exhibitions too. Um, so this is a Caribbean house in Prospect Park. Um, and inside, sometimes we use the space for exhibitions and sometimes we use it for pop-up shops. And then around it, usually there is a happening. So we would have a dance class or a film screening or you know other types of, of programs that take place um, around like you know when it's warmer and nicer outside. And how can we find out more about if tours are going on during COVID, um, merch and things like that? How, where can we go to learn more about this on our own? Yeah, so you can go to um, our website, caribbean.com. From there, you, sh you can get to our shop. Um, our Little Caribbean has its own website. It's littlecaribbean.nyc. Um, we spend most, time, most of our time on our Instagram. Um, so you can also follow us at I am Caribbean or Little Caribbean NYC. Um, and so you'll find out more about the tours there. Right now, we're thinking about pivoting the tours. So the tours in the past, the way they've been held, is you would, you know, we would have a number of businesses that we would go to, and then um, you would actually go inside. So, you know, when we go to like Allen's Bakery, we go inside, they give us currants rolls, black cake, cone, some mini patties, or you go to La Bay Market, he's making, fresh coconut sorrel. His sister's, his sister's name is Margaret and she's making like this awesome food for us, like bread fruit and fish and fish cakes. And it's like amazing. Uh, you go to Jen's Roti, we're having like doubles, like mini doubles. Peppas, we're having jerk chicken and festival. But like now it's tight. Like we can't, a lot of these places are really small. Like it's really hard to like, they're trying to, 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 to sustain themselves through the pandemic. And it's very difficult to try to walk in that business, um, you know, trying to do a tour and de detracting them from them just trying to operate and stay afloat. Um, so we're, we're looking at a different model like of, of the tours in the spring because there a lot of people have been asking about it. Um, you know, people have wanted to gift tours for, for Christmas over the holidays, um, but we didn't have a clear answer, but like now I have, a, I have an idea, so. Um, and we also have a new tour guide um, that we're bringing on. She's also from um, the neighborhood. She is, I believe she's Grenadian, Jamaican. She's awesome. So stay tuned. You just have to watch the space. And with that, 
I want to say thank you beyond all measures of the world. Thank you, Shelly, for not only doing the work that you do, but sharing it with us and taking time out of your day to speak to the attendees, to me, to everybody on this call. It's not only been a privilege to learn about this, but again, a joy to learn that this exists. The simple existence and the acknowledgement is not enough. The work and the standpoint and the power of the footprint that we're putting into Flatbush and all of New York of the Caribbean community. So thank you for your time, your energy and your effort. Thank you to all the attendees for your absolutely engaging and pitiful questions. And I'm going to pass this off to Charmaine to introduce our musical guest in this next portion of this talk. And thank you all for your, um, what's the right word? Uh, engagement, engagement and attention. I know 7 p.m. On a, on a Wednesday, sometimes it's hard to be engaged. So thank you all, I really appreciate it. Just to give you some Trini slang, we were liming. So everyone that's here, we were liming. That means friends are here together and we're discussing, we're having fun. So thank you both Anna Louisa and Shelly. And I'm going to actually introduce Kareem Thompson. He actually just put out an album called Pan Roots and Culture in 2017. And tonight he's just gonna give you a little taste of the Caribbean with some steel pan music. So I hope you enjoy. And further ado, I'm going to just now send it over to Kareem. So thank you. Oh, sorry. Hello, my name is Kareem. Everybody can hear? Yes, I'm unmuted. Um, similar to Shelly, I was born in Brooklyn as well, uh, born and raised. So I'm pretty much familiar with mostly everything she spoke about in Brooklyn. Um, and also similar to Shelly, my, my family is from Trinidad as well. So, you know, we kind of have that connection there. But um, just a little brief um, information about myself and the steel pan, which is here in the background. Um, as you know, um, Brooklyn Knight. Um, and it's, it's, it's a thing I like to mention as well with this whole Caribbean top, topic we're having. Um, people see me and they see my locks and they automatically assume that I'm Jamaican, but not even just me. Like even when they see this instrument or when they see or hear a different accent, they automatically assume that it's Jamaica. So there's a thing that um, a lot of Brooklynites and people associated with the Caribbean have to go through, but it's just funny. So I just had to mention it. Um, also, I went to, I'm a professional musician. I graduated from Berkeley College of Music. I also teach there now. Um, steel drum, this is a double seconds steel drum. It's in the baritone voice. Um, the steel drum was invented in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, somewhere around the end of World War II. And there's not a definite date of when the steel drum was invented because at that time, no one was taking notes or you know documenting history. So there's always like a debate of who did what at what time, but for the most part, um, we all know who invented it, which would be uh, Winston Spree Simon. But um, enough with the talking, let me play some music. Thank you. 
Calypso by Lord Kitchener, a pioneer in Calypso music and um, a great contributor to steel pan music as well. Thank you. 
That was wonderful, Kareem. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed that. You brought it from old to new. Lord Kitchener, very highly entertain the most entertainer in Trinidad. Um, and I know that you said that your grandfather also steal um, played steel pan in the 60s. Right, right. So my grandfather is the reason why I play steel pan. He brought the culture from Trinidad, directly from Trinidad here to New York and he had steel, he always had the steel pans in the house. So naturally as a kid, I gravitated to it and it's been history since then. Excellent. And yes, we, you know, we do have to teach our children, keep the culture and mm -hmm. them just that it will keep on going. The same thing for Little Caribbean. Thank you for Shelly for putting that on the map because once we leave the community, at least Little Caribbean will still be there and thriving. So thank you everyone for joining us on this very special night. Thank you, Anna Luisa. Thank you, Shelly, for all that you do for the community. And thank you for Kareem um, for that entertaining steel pan. Thanks. And from, from all of us at Macaulay Honors College, thank you all in attendance. Again, we're all friends now since we've been liming. So hopefully you'll um, stay tuned with other programming that we have coming up. March is um, women's, um, our Women's Month. So we will be having a book talk with Dr. Daniels, who is also Caribbean. She's from St. Lucia and um, she wrote a children's book. So please stay tuned. That will be on March 4th at 7 p.m. Um, and that you can find more information and sign up on our website. Thank you everyone and have a great night.